Good morning. Jay, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, great to see everybody. My name is Ben Proctor. Um, I'll kind of kick things off this morning and then uh, we'll, we'll get into some accreditation conversations and I'll come back at 10 and, and kind of walk through some things with you as we kind of think forward about what we want to do uh, throughout this year with curriculum leaders and and some of the, the in-person opportunities that we'll have. Um, so welcome. Uh, this first meeting is gonna be a little bit different than what we do as we move forward in terms of just kind of connecting through Zoom and spending a little bit of time with Jay and, and Myron uh, going through accreditation. Um, I guess the first thing, this first hour, it's, it's uh, KSCD kind of, uh, uh, running that. So I don't know if anybody wants to take over and, and start that process, or if we want to just go ahead and get started with Jay, but I invite whomever to, to jump in here and then I'll be back with you at 10 and we'll kind of walk through some things about how we want to move forward. So. So I'm Dr. Hanselcheck. I'm the executive director of Kansas KASCD and awesome to have everybody together again this year and typically in the past what we have done is this first hour is just a networking session and we kind of survey the field to see what that big topic is that people would like to discuss and i know that kisa is kind of been that topic and the needs assessment and just some questions around that topic in general and so Myron and Jay were kind enough to join us this morning and I've kind of had some initial conversations with them. So Jay's gonna visit with us a little bit on some of those topics. Myron might support that conversation and then we'll open it up for questions and for sharing. Well, thanks, Valora. Hey, it's great to see uh, as many of you as I can see on, on this morning. Um, Hey, welcome to fall, right? As soon as it becomes fall, the weather just changes just like magic. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy to think we're already in fall. And there are, I think I saw people wearing sweaters yesterday. So, um, so thanks for having us on, Valora. Thanks for the invitation. Um, as we go through this, I'm really just going to, at a high level, talk through our new team a little bit um, and then talk about specifically about the needs assessment process um, that and because that becomes out of all the phases of continuous improvement that seems to be the one that people narrow in on when we're talking about school improvement and so kind of where you start with that so we're going to walk into that um, if you have any questions as we go even if they're off topic uh, Kisa questions that's fine just throw those in the chat I think Myron's going to try to to weigh in on, on those in the chat. And then uh, we'll take any questions after that as we begin this networking session. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And I wanted to start with our, um, hang on one second, let me throw these in the chat. So everybody has these. I wanted to start with our mission as a team. Um, obviously you're all well aware of our, through those slides in the chat, if you want to use those or reference those later, but everybody's aware of our vision. We want to lead the world in the success of each student in Kansas. So our mission as an accreditation and design team is really to do two things, provide accountability and then support as we, as systems move towards uh, the success of each student ensuring that. So that accountability can look multiple different ways. One uh, aspect of accountability that we started this summer was a summer check-in. We did that on a pilot basis. So there were just, I think we had about 25 systems come in this year uh, in this summer as they brought in their budgets to be reviewed. They also brought in their KISA documentation. We believe that's, that's important. And so I um, wanted to just kind of blend with that budget review process. And so we had really good conversations with those systems. Uh, they're all in year five coming up this next year. 
So it was, it was a good time to really talk through at a high level the results side that they're seeing, the process side that they're seeing. So that's an example of accountability. Support is much like today. Um, as we talk through just providing some support in terms of resources, ideas, tools that systems can use to uh, continue to move towards their vision. This is our new team, um, Accreditation and Design. It is a blending of KISA and Redesign. So, uh, you know, Redesign was really at that building level. KISA is at the system level. We've blended those together now into Accreditation and Design. This is our team. Uh, you know, Myron, Myron's on here today. We also have Catherine Schmidling. She is our assistant director of educator preparation. So we're connecting P12 accreditation with higher ed teacher prep accreditation. A lot of people don't know KSD actually accredits the teacher preparation programs at the higher ed level in Kansas. So we're connecting all that together. So just at a high level with with accreditation, there's really three things we're looking at in terms of accreditation in Kansas. It's growth in student performance or results, it's process, and then it's compliance. So all three of those are factors in an accreditation determination made by the ARC. And then the design part are really the design principles. Um, if you're a redesign school, these are very familiar to you. And so as we move forward, these design principles really came about through the community conversation six years ago. Um, in, the, in response to the question, what is K-12's responsibility in producing students that have these attributes, these young adult attributes, this is a consolidation of those things that that Kansans said they wanted to see in their K-12 systems. And so we wanna to continue to push this forward. And this was reinforced through this success tour that Dr. Watson and Dr. Nguyen-Swanner went on in 2021. So it continues to drive the work. And a lot of people ask us, well, how do the design principles fit into accreditation? It really comes down to the strategies. The strategies that you implement that are implemented in the classroom need to align with these four design principles as we move forward. So that's really where the design piece comes in is the, are the strategies that you're implementing to improve student performance, to improve student success, that those align with these four design principles. So I wanna jump into some, just some resources. I'll start with our webpage, um, Sarah Perryman, who's not with us today has done a phenomenal job in revising this web page. So this is our main page. And I just want to scroll down to this system or district process information. So you can see we had there, this is kind of a summary of our summer check-in pilot that I spoke of earlier. I want to narrow in on just on this continuous improvement process that we have used through the pilot, the regional pilots that we uh, started last year and are continuing this year. So we have 11 systems across Kansas at three different uh, sites, uh, service center sites that are we're working through the process side of accreditation. And really the aim is to get people together regionally uh, so they act as their OVT and then follow these steps of a continuous improvement process. So I really want to focus in today on this data analysis piece, because really data analysis is that needs assessment process. So we have some tools, some guidance here in terms of support for systems that are looking for this whole needs assessment process. How can we strengthen that? How can we get a deeper understanding of our current state um, in our system? And so we have these action steps uh, where you gather the quantitative and the qualitative data in your system. Obviously, the quantitative data, it starts with that accountability report. Um, but there's a lot of quantitative data that, that you have to look at in terms of student performance. The qualitative data 
sometimes can be a little bit harder to think through. But if you think about, we have these foundational structures rubrics. So if you're wondering about where are we on curriculum instruction and assessment, you can use these foundational structures rubrics to identify your current state in, in those. We also are encouraging a lot of people to, or we're encouraging everybody to use the star recognition rubrics. Even if you don't want to apply, use those as a teaching tool, a, a, an evaluation of where your system is with kindergarten readiness, for example. So the qualitative star recognition rubrics can be a really good learning, they can be really good learning tools uh, as part of that needs assessment process. Analyze that data, prioritize data points. This is something that we, we started last year with the regional pilots is looking at the perceptions that exist in your district. And, and if, if I asked you this question, do all the perceptions in your district align with what your real data is telling you? You're probably gonna say, absolutely not. There are a lot of wild ideas that, that go through that are around a system. And so what we had systems do last year was actually take that perception data and compare it with their real data to get a clearer picture of where they are as a system. So I'll just click on this past perception surveys. Actually, I'm gonna hold off on that for a second. I'll go to, to a, a little bit more specific perception survey here in a second. So these, as you get into perception versus reality and move into the, what's the root cause? Okay, we've identified this as an issue in student performance, the perceptions around it or the real data around it. What's the root cause? So we have a lot of tools that we worked through with systems last year in the regional pilot that really are, are strong tools, the systems that use these and then turnkey these back in their buildings um, and in their system felt like this led to a much clearer picture of the current state of student performance in, in the system. So I'm gonna go back to the, our slides. Myron, I'm not checking the chat. So if anything pops up that we need to open up and discuss, um, let me know. Um, so our training and our calendar, our training is basically our support, our, our setup, our training and calendars uh, events are right there. If you wanna click on those. And then any type of communication with our team, if you're having trouble with signing in to the authenticated application, the KESA app, uh, please email help de helpdesk at ksd.org. Any content though, with the KESA app or otherwise um, accreditation at KSDE. So I wanna talk specifically about a perception survey that we formulated about a year and a half ago and then used in our regional pilot. It's a perception survey that looks at these major components in your system. So obviously the state board outcomes are what we're all shooting for, it's our North Star. But what about the leadership and culture in your system, curriculum instruction and assessment, the design principles, database decisions and foundational structures. So we formed up based on these six components, we formed up a perception survey that we call the component baseline analysis. These are the components, these six. Who takes it? All certified staff and administrators. It's a Qualtrics survey, so we could preview the items. I'm not gonna take the time. We can do that if you'd like, uh, but it's a Qualtrics survey. There's a link that you can go to and I'll, and I'll show you where that is when we get to the, uh, pay, the web page. And then if you, if you survey your staff and use the CBA and you wanna get your results, you email us at accreditation at ksd.org and we will send those to you. Ann Yates is our Qualtrics expert. She does an excellent job of getting this. The, the turnaround time is really good um, uh, for the Qualtrics results. So I'm just gonna click here. This is our, what we call our perception survey page. And this is just some, just some information around the component baseline analysis. If you're interested in in identifying what's the perception 
in our system around leadership and culture or the state board outcomes. So Sarah has put a PowerPoint. There's a recording of a training that she did not long ago. Um, and this CBA administration guidance, you can find, if you go into that document, you can find the link to actually administer that you can send to your uh, staff to administer that. We, I think we even have an email that, that you can send, a sample email that you can send to your staff explaining the CBA. So we've really tried to make it as, as simple as possible in terms of uh, administering that, that particular survey. Um, oops, let's go back to this. So that's really what I wanted to share in terms of around the needs assessment process, those steps, the resources, and then specifically this component baseline analysis, if you're interested in identifying maybe the perceptions that exist in your, in your uh, system as you begin that needs assessment process. I know not everybody is at the beginning of a needs assessment process. I know many of you understand that the, uh, the importance of doing a needs assessment every year. Uh, what I just showed you there is a little bit deeper, but maybe there are parts of that deeper dive that you would wanna use if you're in the middle of a process where you're, you're pretty far into it, but you wanna revisit re, uh, the, the state uh, in your district. So that's just a little bit about needs assessment, about our team. Um, and I would love some questions if we wanna start there. Laura, is there anything else that you wanted me to touch upon? No, I think that's great. Thank you, Jay. What is, the, you said that it's fast on the turnaround time for the CBA information. How fast is it? Well, as soon as you, Kylie, as soon as you let us know that your staff has completely done that, mm -hmm. I think within a week, we can get that back to you. Okay. I'm speaking for Ann, which I should never do, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's a pretty quick turnaround. Okay. Well, I just wondered if you were a year five school and wanted to have that even mm -hmm. as, a, as an ending result that you could use to kind of gauge where you were going, even if you didn't have it initially, um, would it be feasible to get that in the time frame? Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, as a year five, because most of your fives really aren't thinking about that, right? They're wrapping things up, but to be thinking about this is our current state. And, and I think that's an important piece that it's not a beginning and an end year one and year five. This is a continuous process, right? Yep. Excellent. So Jay, let me follow up on, on Kylie's question. Um, I know you had an opportunity to work with a lot of schools through redesign utilizing the CBA, did most of those systems use that at the beginning as a needs assessment or is it kind of an annual thing where they track uh, progress on those perceptions? Well, I mean, the CBA, we've only really administered it to the pilot systems, the 11 pilot systems that started in the regional model last year. So we really never used it with the redesign systems, Myron, but so we wanted to test it out with those systems last year. And I think, to a, to a system, they felt like it gave them some really solid data to either reinforce or refute the real data that they're seeing in there in terms of student performance. So it's really just about a year and a half old. Jay, one of the things um, last year when we gave the assessment um, as part of the pilot is that we weren't able to really break the data down by building. Um, has that been updated? Yes, it has. Um, and I know that was, again, that's, that's why we pilot it, right? So you can, all can tell us this is what we would like to see. So yes, you can actually do that by now because uh, there's, a, there's a, a choice at the beginning of that uh, at the building level. So we actually have a drop down. So even like a Kansas City, Kansas, they could select the building that they represent and then you can get that report by building. Thank you. I think that'll be very helpful. Yeah. I'll just chime in. I know there's some others that were on as part of the pilot. I know there's others on here that were part of the pilot, but we did find that data useful when we were doing our needs assessment um, together. 
the perceptions of our staff uh, around the foundational structures, the design principles, um, and the other elements. It, it was interesting data, and we used that as we were uh, year one last year to try and come up with uh, our goal areas. Jay, a uh, quick question. When, when you complete the CBA, what's the actual format that the data is returned to you? Is it in like a CSV sheet or some other type of thing? Let me pull that up. Monty, that's a good question. I think I'm in the right spot. Oops, sorry. Okay, are you seeing the uh, CBA? Nope. The website's showing. Okay. So this sample report. Are you all seeing this? Okay. So it'll show you, Monty, uh, how many took it, your response, the different positions that uh, responded. And then it really jumps into the state board outcomes. Uh, the prompts, you can see there's about five or six prompts per, uh, per component. And then here is the report itself. So this shows the level of agreement for each. So state board outcome number one, social emotional skills. This shows the level of agreement by on, on social emotional skills, for example. So four out of five uh, agree with that. And then this shows the percentage breakdown. And you can see again, uh, as Jennifer asked, you can see it at the, at the district level. You can also break it down by building. So it's really um, gives you kind of two windows to look at it, two lenses to look at the at the data. Within the CBA, is there a component that allows for um, school board members to also participate? We haven't set it up for that, Kylie, yet, um, but there are other surveys. I was going to share this um, anyway, and, and you reminded me, but there, there's a family survey or, or parent survey that um, KPERC, the Parent Information Resource Center through TASN, Jane Groff, they have a family survey that you can send to community members, to board members, and it is a perception survey. It's not necessarily aligned with these components, but maybe you're not looking at that specifically, right? With your, with your board members or community members. So I would um, promote that. I don't know if Jane is on here or somebody uh, could throw that in the chat um, in terms of a, a link to that survey, but I know that it's out there. I know many systems use it. And uh, so that's another look at perceptions in your community. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Jay. Is anybody have any questions for Jay, Myron? Is Sarah on here? Sarah is in Spain, so we oh, can gosh, all be Sarah. jealous of, jealous of her for a second. Um, she'll be out uh, this week and next week. So, um, yeah, she's not with us well, today. Public kudos to Sarah. She's done a lot of work on that website. Looks nice. She's done great work. And if she would have known about this, she probably would have tried to zoom in from Spain. But I was like, nope, you're not doing that. Happy to answer questions. Uh, stay on. But other than that, thank you for your attention. And, and we'll, we'll just hang out and uh, track the conversation as we move forward. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, being new, this is this has been, again, um, at KSDE, one of the things over the past several months, I go to a lot of meetings, some on Zoom, some in person, and I find myself asking, am I supposed to run this meeting? So that's a common question that I ask. So if I'm not supposed to jump in at this point, let me know, because <clears throat> um, this is my first curriculum leaders meeting, um, but I do have some information that I can walk through. So Valora, is this a good time or? Is there some other this discussion? Be, this would be great. Um, okay. Just to kind of give you some background, Ben, we, we have typically for this first hour just networked. Mm -hmm. And so I try and hit those topics. And if you have some hot topics to share, please, yes, share that information. Thank you for that. Sure. Well, I love, I love to network. Um, so 
just jump in, anybody jump in at any time. Um, but just want to, I, I guess I should probably also start by saying that while I like the convenience of Zoom, <clears throat> I'd really like to meet with people in person. And I think there's some some topics that we'll want to talk about that are going to be really good uh, to bring people together and, and kind of uh, visit, you know, in small groups and large groups. And, and we can talk a little bit about format of meetings, but this will be just kind of an opportunity to, to maybe uh, set the stage for what's to come. And, and we'll walk through some dates and uh, maybe some of the big topics that you want to talk about moving forward. There's a few. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a lot happening with legislation and requirements, and some of it even gets into the world of curriculum and teaching and learning. So we'll we'll spend some time this year on those things, so you you feel well equipped and you know how to address some things that uh, maybe are new and and that we haven't necessarily been required to do in the past. But um, let's see here if I can. They give me a lot of screens here too at KSD. I'm not used to having so many screens, so we'll try to share the right thing. Are you seeing kind of a Word document, Jay, that has curriculum leaders up at the top? No. We're seeing your screensaver, Ben. Okay. <laughs> and it's really nice. Well, thank you. Okay. We don't have a cluttered desktop. That's well, a <laughs> I've got a few different windows that would suggest otherwise. Did I do any better there? Yeah, there you okay. go. Okay, so just a, a quick outline here of uh, some things that is, and if you don't know Pat, you need to get to know Pat. She kind of uh, takes care of my daily schedules and organizes things and and um, she'll drop some links in the, the chat as far as kind of where we house some things on our website and, and uh, it's just some resources that can be very valuable. But we do have a curriculum leaders web page. And if you go to the learning services page and you scroll past the ugly guy there, um, there's a link for curriculum leaders. And if you click on that, that's that's where we've organized just some good information for this group, uh, both you know relevant to to topics. There's there's information from past meetings that I'm sure a lot of you attended, and meeting dates for this year. And we're going to talk through those a little bit here, so you know what to expect and where we've made some adjustments. But there is a, a curriculum leaders page or we've got some work to do with our website but there is some information that you can find that'll be available for you and we'll continue to add information as we go through this year including this meeting that's uh, recorded will be available too um, but looking at the dates for this year we're going to meet it's kind of a an extra date again just a desire to bring people together in person on November 2nd, and that'll be our first chance to, to come to Topeka. Um, it'll be more or less a, a day from nine to two, which I think is a pretty typical schedule. And uh, it'll be uh, uh, an opportunity for us to kind of dig into some of these topics and really discuss them and, and collaborate on ideas. And, and uh, again, with some new things that we have going on, I think that'll be really important. The other two dates have been scheduled for a while, and I know if you're if you're used to to attending meetings with curriculum leaders, I my understanding is they're typically on Fridays, and because we scheduled an extra date there for November, it just didn't work to meet on a Friday, so we're going to meet on a Wednesday. Uh, but January and April will be our next two dates that we'll be meeting, all planned from nine to two, and we're going to feed you. So there'll be some food involved. And uh, so that that registration, I think Pat will drop a link in on, on where you register, but it would be $10 and that'll cover the cost of food. Did you know that the cost of food is increasing in our world? So we're having to deal with some of those types of things, but hopefully that's still a good deal for you. So those are our planned in-person meetings as we walk through hey, the- ben? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I interrupt for just a second? I think April 20th is a Thursday. Is it the okay. 21st? 
We'll, we'll have Pat check us on that. That's good, good catch. So we'll get, we'll, we'll see if it's going to be on Thursday the 20th or Friday the 21st. And I think we're still also looking for locations there for those two dates. So we'll, we'll, that's a little ways away. So it'll give us time to make sure we know what the right day is, but we'll get that information to you shortly. And Pat just dropped in the chat April 21st. Awesome. So those are the dates. Um, several people have mentioned some topics that that you would like to discuss. Um, I want to. We're, we're not going to again spend a lot of time on it today, but um, we have our our research and evaluation team here at KSDE is is putting together some really good, what I would call very comprehensive data. And in October, Dr. Watson is gonna share as part of a presentation to the state board, some of this new data that, that we've put together. And just to give you a little bit of, of a preview, it's taking academic performance data on our state assessments and looking at when you break that down by the different categories, we're looking at eventual graduation rates that are associated with each of those performance levels. We're tying it to post-secondary effectiveness as well, and looking at other relevant measures that we can find, like what are the average ACT scores for those students that might perform in a given level. And so we're, we're with our R&E team, our research and evaluation team, we're trying to, to create a pretty good look at connecting academic performance on state assessments with some other measures that we feel like are really important to understand. And a lot of you are probably aware, I wasn't as a school superintendent, I uh, just didn't dig quite deep enough, but we had people in our district that were, that if you go into AMOS, you can break those performance levels down, not just by four categories, but eight. And the significance there, if you look at your local district data and you look at those, the, the new state assessment scores or different groups um, uh, over the years, what you can see is when you're looking at, at, say, a level one student, you can see how many of those kids are distributed in the bottom half of level one versus the top half of level one. Same with level two bottom half of level two, top half of level two. And I, I think that what that tells us is. What's, what's the likelihood of moving those kids? You know, if that what we see is a pretty small percentage of students who are at the bottom half of level one in both math and ELA. We have a large percentage of students that are in the top half of level one, especially if you look at, at upper grade levels, eighth grade into that sophomore year. And so what our team has done is they've taken those different levels, eight performance levels, and again, connected it to graduation rates. So the percentage of students who score in the bottom half of level one, their graduation rate isn't as good as those that score on the other side of that chart if they're up into the three and four range. We, we would know that without having to have verification of the data. But when we get together in November, we're going to spend time on that data and try to dig into the implications. What does that mean in terms of the goals we have, you know, related to accreditation or just the, the, the vision that you have, the, the specific goals you have related to your vision in your local district? But we feel like it's pretty important data. We previewed that with school superintendents. The, the superintendent council meeting was this week, so we shared a little bit of that data. If you've had a chance to maybe talk to a superintendent that attended or, or get a chance to do so, ask them about that. And we're gonna ask for feedback as we continue to try to dig into that data. What we're looking at is just trying to create something that's pretty comprehensive. That, that doesn't reflect just one moment in time, but how, do, how does one performance measure impact other outcomes that we feel like are pretty important. So we're going to spend time on that. Again, if you get a chance to tune into the state board meeting in October, Dr. Watson will walk through that data, and that'll be kind of a kickoff point 
for what we feel like could be a, a pretty important discussion moving forward. So one topic, any, any questions on that or Dr. Watson, if I, you know, if there's more to explain there, feel free to jump in, but we're kind of excited about it. Ooh, uh, we are, we are very excited. As Ben said, what we're really super focused on, as I know you are, is what are the data points that tell us that students are headed toward graduation with the skills to be successful after high school? And our research and evaluation teams looking at a ton of data relative to what is working, what, what we can help you uh, analyze within your own data. So Ben, thank you for putting that together in your team. And uh, we'll, we'll have that out to, uh, to all of you just as soon as the state board gets a comprehensive look at it. Yeah. So Jennifer, I, my understanding, I, I don't see the, the district reports anymore, but if you look in AMOS and look at performance categories, you would see that broken up into eight. I, I believe all systems can see that. And, and the way that's distributed, again, it's, it's just that, that kind of 50% mark upper or lower levels. And uh, uh, we, we feel like that's an important way to break the data down. I, I quizzed our superintendents um, on Wednesday, I believe it was Wednesday, um, and asked them, where do you think, and, and, and the data that we're looking at here, because we only have so many years since we began this particular assessment, we're looking at those, those high school performances. Um, we're going to be able, as we go through the years, be able to look back to earlier grades to see what the eventual graduation rates are, post-secondary effective rates. But the data that you'll see in November, or if you tune into the state board meeting in October, will be sophomores from 2017. So how did the sophomores of 2017 perform in math and ELA? How many of those kids in each of those eight levels went on to graduate, went on to meet post-secondary effectiveness and I can tell you, when I ask the superintendents, where do you think the, the largest percentage of kids are distributed? If you take those eight levels, nobody got it right. They all guessed high. And to give you the answer, the highest percentage is at a high level one. So if you look at, at 2017 sophomores, the highest percentage in both ELA and math, as far as which category saw the most kids, was a high level one. That's still the case with the current most recent high school students that took the assessment in 2022. It's actually a higher percentage with our current group than it was in 2017. So we have the, the largest percentage of students in that, that high level one category, which means they're not in low level one. So even though we're seeing more kids in level one, they're, they're at a high level one which gives us some ability to do some work to move them into level two. What we start to see is significant growth or improvement in graduation, post-secondary effectiveness, and, uh, and even that ACP mean score when you start to move into level two. You're probably aware of this, but level two students are not failing students, right? Um, and when you get into a high level two, you start exceeding state averages on ACT graduation rates, post-secondary effectiveness. So that's, that's why we feel like there's a lot of good information in this data. Uh, we even see students that score at the top end. You know, if we're in eight categories, they're, they're at level eight, uh, but there's a percentage that don't graduate or don't meet post-secondary effectiveness. So uh, you'll get a chance to spend time with that data and talk about what it means for our systems, what it means for your work, but that gives you a little bit of a preview and, and uh, what we've done with, with superintendents or with a few groups that we've been meeting with is trying to say, how can we make this most comprehensive? So tell us, you know, here's an initial look. It was really simple at first four four performance levels and just graduation post-secondary. Now we've, we've connected ACT and some other things to that as well. We're also looking at, you know, if you're a, a low level one or a high level one or, or high level four, what, whatever it is, 
what are what's the post secondary credential that they're receiving how are they meeting that post secondary effective rate so you can see what kids are getting certificates or which students are are being retained that second year in in college you know those types of things as well so other thoughts or questions there on that topic as, as part of that conversation, we want to talk about assessment literacy. That term has come up a few times, and we've got some experts, and I know a lot of you are as well, but just how do we uh, provide information, good information, on what different assessments do? That comes up a lot with uh, some of our screening data, you know, in systems that are using FastBridge or Ames Web, and what does that look like compared to you know, academic performance on a state assessment, really spending time talking through that. Uh, we've got partners that do a lot of uh, training with MTSS and alignment, and just wanting to make sure that we ultimately have shared outcomes that, that we're working towards. And so we're gonna spend time on that. We know, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of new legislation that probably impacts the world that, that you oversee and so we've got some great resources within the agency and within across the state where we can start speaking to some of those requirements that we have in place and some specific questions that come up or, or request to talk about, um, you know, House Bill 2567, which addresses many, many different things that we do in schools. And so we just want to walk through that legislation on on uh, third grade reading or using non-academic screeners and surveys. You know, what does that mean? I know that's been a big topic for a lot of people. Um, so a lot of, lot of topics and what we are requesting from you, send us those things that you wanna talk about. And when we get together on the 2nd of November, we'll be able to, to really dig into that together in person. Ben, we have a question in the chat asking if it would be possible to walk through the steps of how to access that data in AMOS. I don't know if there's a plan on doing that today or if we could send out guidance. What's your thought there? Sure. We, we will definitely send out guidance. Um, we can, uh, I don't have it. And again, with like four different screens, I'll probably not do a good job of navigating that. But if you log into web applications, um, as you know, over on the left side, you'll you'll have a few different reports that you can pull up. There's a lot of good stuff there, uh, but whenever you go in and and we'll we'll walk through it. We we call it API. I think that was just mentioned in the chat, and so you can when you when you pull up that API report, that's where it's going to give you a percentage and also a a definitive number of students that performed in any one of those eight categories but as soon as we're done here we'll put a step by step together on exactly what you need to do to pull that data up other other questions along topics just send us send us those topics and and we'll make sure to get them situated in that agenda and those discussion items uh, for November 2nd, for sure, and, and we'll keep talking about them as we move forward through the year. So part of that discussion as we move forward, again, new new guy uh, to this group and, and to, to KSDE, um, it's been a wonderful experience here. I started on July 1, and uh, great, great people and great resources. And it's been a lot of fun getting to know people around the state. And I, I, my wife gave me advice when I first started and basically was just don't mess things up. And uh, so we're trying hard not to do that. But I know there's a, a, a format that we've used for curriculum leaders. And, and um, I know kind of the way I've always done things and but we want to just make this a great opportunity to get together and collaborate and and but also provide updates and information that you need to know so not only with topics but also with format if you have suggestions on how we can make that the most productive time possible you're if, if you're coming to Topeka in November or in January or in April 
you're giving up time that you could be doing you know, something else in your district. We want it to be extremely valuable time. That's where if we're gonna talk about data, we want it to be very relevant data. And if you have topics that you wanna discuss, we wanna make sure that we're doing a good job getting the information to you that, that you need so you can go back and best serve the people in your community. So there'll be opportunities for, for you and for our team to provide really good updates. That's gonna be important. But we also wanna spend time talking about issues and collaborating on ideas on you know, how we can best use data. Um, you know, there's been uh, uh, you know, kind of questions about how do we use state assessment data? What's the validity of our state assessments? Do we, do we elevate those too much or not enough? And, and talking about, you know, again, how do we look at that in a more relevant way or a more comprehensive way? And hearing from you is gonna be really important you know, as we move that conversation forward. Um, understanding that if we're talking about um, post-secondary effectiveness, you know, we, we need to recognize what that data tells us. What does it really mean? Because there's questions about how valid is that data? Because we know we have students who are successful that aren't included there. So how do we take some of these measures that we feel are pretty good and talk about, you know, how we best use those things? And we'll spend time collaborating on that. But topics, specific things that you want to talk about and how you want to format those meetings so that we can make them most productive is going to be really important. So please share ideas on that. Are you signed up for the annual conference? I, I asked that of the superintendents Wednesday and they all started shaking their head and I said, you're a bunch of liars. You are not signed up because our our registration right now is a little lower than what it has been in the past, but we'd really like for you to uh, consider coming to Wichita um, October 19th to the 21st. And I think Pat just dropped a link to the registration for the annual conference. We've got really, really good breakout sessions. Maybe some of you are involved in that already, but registration is a little low. The deadline is not until October 10th, so there is time, but we would love for you to, to register and to be a part of that event. I think this is the first time we've been in person for a while. Um, so again, you know, taking advantage of those opportunities and getting out and about will be, I think, important for us as we move forward. So we want to make sure that we put that information out to you. I think all the breakout sessions now are organized so you can see if you if you follow the link there, what those are and what our primary topics are, uh, but really hope that we can get good attendance. It's always good to have quite a few folks. We've seen it uh, tick up here over the past several days and hope that continues. So, so those were my, my thoughts uh, again. There's a lot you can accomplish through Zoom. We really want to commit to trying to, to get together in person. And uh, we feel like we've got some really good topics to address. And so our hope is that you can make it in November up to Topeka. And uh, in that meeting too, we'll spend time just talking about what we want to accomplish, how we want to accomplish it, and how we can best serve what, what you need us to um, as an agency. You know, as I've come in trying to just like we do in our, our school systems, you really try to assess your organization. Uh, we're looking at just internal culture. You know, how do how do we optimize what we do at KSDE in the Division of Learning Services so that we can best support you? And we're spending a lot of time talking about that right now. Uh, so that's very important to us. And we feel like the, the opportunities to get together are just extensions of that work. And we feel like we're moving in a good direction as far as that goes. So what, what questions or thoughts or, or what, what things can we answer for you? I know we've got some of our team here that might be able to, to do that as well. Pat, did I miss anything? I kind of have a, just a general and loops back to a Kisa question, but um, as we're, I'm a, from a really small district. And so when we look at 
some of our student accountability measures, one of the biggest challenges we have is um, <clears throat> of one or two student swings swings our whole norm uh, pretty significantly. But my my big question is, is there uh, back to any movement for um, the ability for school districts to say we have students making growth even if it's just within the range like with with your new amos report showing the eight um eight, eight levels can we show that growth within that range rather than saying hey we haven't moved all of our kids from level they're still in level one but they've moved from the bottom of one to the top of one or um, some of those kinds of components can we have that piece of conversation and have that be part of a valid conversation for accreditation purposes when we're looking at at that piece of conversation as well. So Kylie that's a really good answer or good question we'll see about the answer, um, but <laughs> we uh, this spring when we went out and had focus groups, what we heard was what you're saying is what are we shooting for. Right? What's the focus? And so we've got a, a work group going on here at KSDE. Uh, and we are, the ideas that we come up with, we're obviously going to run it by groups like this curriculum leaders, but we're talking about how can we narrow down and look at the data that exists. We're not talking about changing the tar, changing the measures, right? Like post-secondary effectiveness or high school graduation. We're talking about looking at a, through a different lens at those. And I think Ben brought up a lot of what we're talking about is getting more specific into the levels on the assessment, but more importantly, how they relate, how they're interconnected with high school graduation, post-secondary effectiveness. So we are actively talking about, you know, looking at data in a different way, a more specific way right? I think in line with what you're asking, a, a, a more clear way, right? And presenting that, um, maybe visually presenting that differently, and then also guidance on how to look at it. So if your state, if your board is looking at it, here's some guidance on how to look at that data and make sense of it. So we're really looking at getting more clear, more specific into those terms, instead of just saying, just look at your post-secondary effective rate, right? and really, really looking at it at a deeper level. Yeah, I would agree, Jay. Um, to your point, Kylie, I think, keep in mind as we do the uh, PISA reports, you know, what's it start out with? Everyone starts out with tell your story. Every system on here today is, is unique. You mentioned it's unique as a really small district and change of one or two students really impacts your, your data. It's like really large systems that are dealing with different kind of demographic data changes things. So it is important that you capture that and that you tell your story in there. But ultimately, what got what's exciting about the information that's been shared and being able to look at, at you know uh, the assessment data over eight categories versus four, and it just allows you to dig in deeper. And at the heart of this whole process is a good needs a good needs analysis, you know, and this really helps you get to a deeper uh, needs analysis of where your students are, where they're actually falling at, and, and uh, are we seeing improvements that may not be showing up in those, you know, threes and fours, but we're seeing kids move from one to two or two to three. So absolutely, that needs to be included as part of your overall needs assessment. And it, it really will kind of inform the strategies that you pick to, to address that. So yeah, I think you're right on target with that. So I, I would agree too, Jay. I think you gave a great answer, and Myron too. Um, you know, the question in the chat about the the perception of the different levels publicly. Um, you know, again, I think we've we've understood as school people when you look at assessment data and you look at the students who may perform at a certain level, and especially when you see level two students. Um, I think we've known for a long time, Shawnee Mission did a study, our, our uh, research and evaluation team did some verification of that. And what we found is uh, a student at level two, uh, again, isn't failing. That's not a failing student. There may be some, <clears throat> you know, some 
academic performance that we want to see improve, you know, as we think about that performance level, which may happen, understanding the, the, the breakdown again by those eight levels. And, and we're not talking about moving to eight levels. That, that's not a part of the conversation. It's just how we look internally at the data it makes it very relevant as we think about movement, you know, how, how kids are distributed across uh, that spectrum looks a little bit different than when you just house them in four performance categories. But what we see in the data and what you will see, and we're, we're gonna fine tune it so that Dr. Watson can present it formally in October, but what you'll see in November is a really clear picture of especially the high level two kit. Um, there is no question based on what we see with graduation rates. It's, it's about 94%. Uh, what you see with, with uh, post-secondary effectiveness, it's, it's over 60%. Uh, what you see with AC to the equivalent ACT score, it's above the state average. You know, it's, so I think we can, we can share good information to correct that narrative that a student is failing or non-proficient or whatever descriptors may be used, which is important. But the data also tells us that there's a lot of kids in level one. And you know, the superintendents didn't know, but you know what that descriptor is for the academic performance level one, and it's limited, right? And I think that's a really good descriptor when you think about having academic, an academic performance level that's the equivalent of about a 16 on the ACT. That's what our data would say. Or you see graduation rates at, a, at in the low 80s if you're in a high level one. You see post-secondary effectiveness around 30% if you're at a high level one. It tell, and that's where the, the, the largest percentage of students are. Over 40% in math, 20, about 28% in the latest data in ELA, if a sophomore is scoring at that level, that's that's about how it plays out when you connect it to graduation and those things. So it tells us good data in the sense that a high level two student, especially even into a low level two, they have they have a lot of the things they need to be successful. Academics are not a huge limitation for that group of students and they are absolutely not failing. When you look at level one students, there are some limitations. We use that term limited to describe their academic performance. And there, there are limitations there. So how do we start to reduce those limitations? And I think the, the group of people here know how to do that. But it's just giving, it's, it's providing some tools and focusing some direction that we can support as an agency. And uh, those are the kind of internal conversations we're having right now. Um, and I think what we're identifying is sometimes there's there's things that we're doing that that we're not all maybe moving in the same direction, you know, and just being able to talk about academic performance in a better way. So we don't shut down the conversation by just saying, you know, it's one test, one moment in time, or the last time we started elevating state assessments, we did some things that probably weren't real effective. We don't want to do those things. You know, we want to be able to utilize this data in a way to to move us forward and connect it more to than just to a test. So it's not it's not promoting um, saying that state assessments are the the end all and be all. It's saying okay, uh, if if maybe the capacity a student has is is level one performance, what do we have to provide for that student? to help them be successful and give them the very best opportunity at the end of the day to find success, knowing that academics may be a limitation. You know, that's where some, some the, the different components of our state vision really come into play. You know, a, a high quality individual plan of study, the type of environment that you put students in, the social skills that they're learning, sitting in those classrooms where teachers just, they, they know how to do that you know, and we're reinforcing all those things. So this is what we'll get into on November 2nd. And uh, I think there's, yeah, I think it'll really help us focus some direction as a state. So we have folks here that are experts that are amazing at what they do that know exactly how to support the work you're doing, because there's such a deep understanding of the direction that we're going. So
just as a, a little preview there. But thank you for the question. I hope that that answers a little bit. I think we'll we'll really be able to refine that messaging when we get together and talk about it more. You know, how do we talk about performance of students so that and, and we can clearly demonstrate that the cutoff for success is not that you're a level three kid. We just need to end that conversation and we've got data to back that up. So some of that I think was reinforced though, Ben, by by some of the legislative legislative power that went forward last in the last session. So um, are we doing some education for those people as well? Because that's part of where that that site is coming out of, as well as with the media. So um, I, and I know that you guys all carry a lot of hats and have a lot going on, but you know, that's, I think what we're all echoing and it sounds like that's what you're echoing. How can we do a better job of helping communicate that? Yep. That's, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, yeah, there, there's going to have to be some strategy and, and my, my personal opinion is, um, no matter what we put out, some, some folks aren't, you know, they're always going to find the negatives in the data. I don't know if they're if, if somebody's coming from a bad place. I don't know that we, you know, should or or can spend all of our energy there. But I think there's there's folks that will see, you know, as as we think about how do we share the data, how do we present it, um, you know, how do we improve it, you know, when we're starting to make really good progress by by you know aligning strategies and and you know understanding exactly what the data means and how we can impact classroom practice um i think there's a lot of people that will will see evidence of that and, and be ready to get on board with the direction that we're going so I'm, I'm not jennifer i'm not totally sure can you share a little bit more on that that question about a new level two sorry um just what the stacy's question was is there a descriptor or a, oh. something that explains that new that api report you know because i think that it seems confusing now you still have a level one two three four i haven't looked at that report but i don't know i want to share it with my staff but i'm not if i'm not i need a way to make sure that it's understood clearly because it will seem they'll be like confused about what is level two now is there a different level two yeah, we, we don't want it to be confusing. And that's why I, I probably, I didn't, I didn't want to go into too much depth today on Zoom. That's why I think in person is going to be really critical. I've had to, I've had a lot of emails from superintendents since Wednesday saying, please send me the data. I want to share it with our board this week. And, and so we're getting a little, a little out ahead of some of that. We, we want people to have an idea of what we're talking about. Um, it's really important. We're not, we're not proposing changing the number of performance categories. Um, some have, have shared with us that they'd love to see us go to five, right? And, and part of that is because we have to, based on uh, the federal requirement, we have to have two levels below proficiency. You know, you, you're probably familiar with that, but you know, some things you just have to check the box and that's one of those things we've had to check the box. But when we get together on November 2nd, we're going to talk about all of this. So I think we can create a lot of clarity on why we're, we're just looking at the data a little bit differently, but not changing anything formally. So it's just digging into it in a way that we can better understand it and the progress we can make. But as far as descriptors for all eight levels, we don't, and, and we're not probably looking at doing that, but I think when we walk away from that meeting on the second, uh, we'll dig into that so that you can take that information and use it in the very, very best way possible. So like I've told the superintendents that are asking for the data, just going to need you to be patient. Um, we want to work with you on how you can pull this data locally. We feel like we can put some things together because I know that'll be another question. Okay, this is statewide data, but what does this mean for me and my district? I think we can support that as well. Um, but after November 2, we'll, we'll kind of dig into that. So be patient and then we'll, we'll spend some time on it. And if you can't make it on November 2nd, let me know and, and we'll figure out a time to get out to you and we can talk through that as well. Report. Yes. So if you're looking at the API data, it calls it level one, two, three, four, all the way to eight. 
right? When you see our report, you're going to see that level one, the official report that we give you, level one includes the, the bottom half and top half of level one. We're not, we're not, we're not going to start saying there's a level eight. We're going to, the language that we'll use is there's a bottom half and top half of each of those performance categories. So you can see, you know, if, if, if you have a KISA goal to move kids to level three, or you have a KISA goal to move kids to level two, we just want you to see what percentage of kids are on the verge of that, or what percentage of kids might be two levels below that. Um, so it's just breaking the data down more clearly for you so that you can use it. Now, I think what we see statewide is we have a lot of kids in level one, but the, the highest portion of them, only about 2%, 2 to 3% of the kids from that, that 2017 sophomore class or the, the kids that took the test last year in 2022, only about 2% of those, school, those kids scored at the bottom half of level one in math. It's a very small percentage but you have a large percentage of kids that scored the top half, that tells us more than if we just look at it as a whole level one category. We're not proposing going to eight levels. We just want you to see the data drilled down a little bit further. So right. I'm just going to chime here, I guess, because I pulled it up and glanced at it real quickly. I just guess, I just think that it's really confusing still calling it level one, level two. I understand okay. your level two is now your high level ones. Your level three is now your low level twos but that is gonna be confusing for people to understand. So why not call it something else? <laughs> we can do that, but that's why it's for you. That's why that's not, that's not for the public. So it's, in, yes, I, we, can, we can do that. That's good feedback, but keep in mind, you gotta log in and, and find that data. So uh, that's no problem. We'll, we'll talk about that internally, but uh, just kind of keep in mind that, that what we're gonna put out it's not gonna. It's not gonna look like what you see in Amos, but and, we'll talk about how we can we can organize that better. I and I under I understand that totally. I just even sharing like with teachers to look at it. It's like a, I mean it becomes confusing when level two is not level two. So sure. anyway, thank you. We'll, we'll work on that and fix that. So on the, on the accountability report, and Jay and Myron, you guys jump in here, um, that, that's a good discussion for us internally. I'm, I'm learning about the history of that. Um, again, as we initiate this conversation around some of the research that we've done in the agency, our, our systems and our structures and the, and the way we communicate, we're, we're not looking at changing that until we start to have good collaboration with you. So we're, we're not proposing that anything is going to change here until we can really understand what the data is telling us and what it means for you. There is conversation about the accountability report, uh, you know, where that started and, and kind of where it is now. And Jay, maybe you could spend a little time talking about kind of the evolution of that and maybe where it goes in the future. Yeah, so Dave, know that the accountability report that's going to come out and be updated in January will not change. You'll see the same accountability report as you've seen previously. But as Ben talked about, and I think it's really important that we all think through this, is what the accountability report doesn't really show right now is the connection between the data points. So you're look, when you look at state assessment scores, you look at those in isolation. And on the accountability report on the front page, it only shows your percentage of threes and fours versus the state. So that's a very limited look into state assessments. But what I like about the direction Ben's taking us is we're, we are connecting those high level metrics that we all look at um, and we're connecting them and showing how they're connected. Um, so we're talking a lot about the look of that accountability report how we can get a deeper look and how we can show the connections between those, uh, those metrics that are, that are on the current accountability report. Because we feel like it's a level one, it's very limited. <laughs> it's a limited accountability report. Um, and now I, I just wanna say this, 
that's where the arc starts within when we're talking about results, the results side of accreditation, that's where the arc starts, but definitely not where it ends, right? The arc looks at all the local data that you provide, but that accountability report is, is very limited in certain parts of that. And we're really looking at revising that. And as Ben said, we'll need your help with that. I don't know if you can answer this, but I am curious how other districts <clears throat> are finding success in tracking um, the dyslexia training that their staff has completed. So we're struggling with new staff coming into our district. How, how should we be documenting if they've received that dyslexia training? So that very good question. Um, and that came up kind of leading into the meeting. And, and what we what we're doing is is putting together a list of those things that we want to walk through with you. Um, some of that will be reaching out to say what what are ways people are finding success with that. Um, so I don't know, Christy, I don't have a good answer, uh, being that it's new. But I think if, if you are having success, that's what we want to talk about and just share ideas. There's a long list of things that are new for us. And so we're just going to have to learn from each other. And I think some folks are dropping some things in now. Um, but what we'll do after this meeting is take some of these specific things that you need to know and put something out. Pat and I will work on putting something out, trying to address that. And then again, when we get together in person, I think we'll be able to have a really good conversation about it. So Google's Thank a you. way to do, yeah, Google's always a good way to, to do things, um, but we can talk about just some structures that maybe we can help with as well. So, and, and Jennifer, I appreciate that. What we're having is staff who are saying they received the training in, a, in another district, and then they have moved into our district. Um, so they're not really wanting to complete the modules again because they're saying they've completed them already. Christy, I've and I this may not be this is just what I've been we, we've been doing is um, I just asked them to reach out to their supervisor and send an email that says that they received it and when they did a lot of them this year of our new teachers actually had it entered in whatever their professional development system was so they were able to just give us their transcript that had that written on it and that was super helpful or they had a certificate that they had received of completion that had the date on it and christy i um I have, um, I wasn't Google Sheets, Excel document, but I have three tabs. One's for current staff, one's for new staff, and one's for exited staff. And so it's all the same headings, but I keep all my new ones and I put whether or not, what their license is and whether or not they need the training. And then if they reached out, if I need to reach out to, or have them reach out to their district, I mark, where we found that information. And then I have a folder where I dump any certificates I, I have them do. And then at the end of the year, I'm just fold all those um, set lines into the other tab for my current staff and start a new one. But I hang on to my exit ones in case that district calls and wants, or that teacher calls and says, I need that information, then I don't have to dig. It's just there. So I set that up that way and it seems to be pretty manageable. And then I got with the business director and the superintendent and whatever they have to fill out on the SO66 as far as how many um, what the job positions were, I make sure I, I tag each person with that job position so I can filter and quickly give them a count of how many staff have completed at each position. That helps. Thank you. I'm hoping an administrative assistant can figure this system out because they're probably much more talented at it than I am. I'm just asking the the teachers if they if they're from another district if they've completed it. So I suppose if there's an issue with me trusting that person or not, I might dig in a little deeper. But I mean, and also if people are lying about dyslexia training, then that's a whole other concern. So for right now, I'm just asking them, and if they say, "Yep, I've done it," then we track it on a Google Sheet. 
We're also tracking it on a Google Sheet, but I do ask all of our new staff to provide the evidence. And so I, as our staff go out at the end of the year, I give them the evidence that they might need in, in whatever new district they're going to. So we appreciate the time. Uh, it's great to see everybody. Really hope you can make it on November 2nd, and we'll get, again, some more information out about that and just some of the topics that we'll be addressing. Um, if you have thoughts or ideas, please let us know. Uh, we will have a good amount of time together, uh, so please let us know format, uh, topics, things that you want to spend time on, and we'll get information out here shortly, kind of on a tentative agenda or list of discussion items. So you can kind of process those and then we'll add to it as we get closer to that date. Is that fair enough? Okay. Jay and Myron, anything else on your end or Pat, if I'm missing anything? Okay. Well, it's Friday. The weather's cooler. All good things. Um, Oklahoma plays K-State tomorrow and I'll be um, down there watching that game in crimson and cream so anyway that's what i bring to the table but um pat will let you know on the recording we'll get that information to you and uh, again if you get a chance maybe try to tune in either live or, or later on when when dr watson does his presentation to the board in october i think some of the questions that we have right now will start to get clarified at that meeting around some of this new data too so i uh, appreciate all your time and and don't hesitate to reach out to anybody uh on our team if you have any specifics so thank you very much have a great weekend